to start. Um, hope everybody is well after well these days or days. Um, let me get us get us back into where we were. We were talking about the issue of how the spokes of a skeletal representation swing as you walk along the skeleton. And so we talked about having the skeleton have a tangent plane at any given point. And now we have a spoke that isn't in the isn't orthogonal to that tangent plane necessarily. More precisely, it is only in, in uh, orthogonal when you have a relative maximum of width or minimum of width of support stability. So you have a funny coordinate system made up of uh sorry to interrupt, but do you do you want to share your screen on Zoom? Oh uh, yeah. Thank you. I didn't do that. Okay, now, thank you. Okay, so we have a funny coordinate system where we have two orthogonal coordinates in the tangent plane and the spoke direction, three unit vectors. Okay, and now we're interested as we walk in some direction, which can be in the tangent plane. That direction can be written as a linear combination of the two tangent plane spanning vectors how the spoke swings when we walk in that direction. So we walk in some direction and the spoke direction vector swings, okay? But because the, the infinitesimal swing is orthogonal to that, we need the projection of that back on to these two vectors, but a funny projection because it's not a projection as if it were three orthogonal coordinates, the projection into this funny non-orthogonal coordinate system, right? The two spanning directions in the tangent plane and the spoke. But when you do that, you get a two by two matrix, and that he calls the right, Damon called the radial shape operator. And the radial shape operator. Um, as real eigenvectors and real eigenvalues. And those real eigenvalues are called the radial curvatures. And the radial curvatures essentially are talking about how fast the spoke swings, or the projected spoke swings. No, how fast the spoke swings in projection. Uh, when you walk in, one of the two principal direction, principal radial directions, which are not themselves, they're both in the tangent plane, but they're not orthogonal. Okay, so we have these but these curvatures. And the interesting thing that we talked about last time was that those curvatures, those radial curvatures, are directly related to the boundary curvature. As long as the radial curvatures are legal, which means that they are less than one, it can be negative or positive, but in any case, less than one, then It's important as we talk about 
statistical variations of these folks across a population. It's important for us to not let the spokes cross. Okay. And we have a requirement of the spoke length compared to one over the radial curvature that will assure that. Okay. And this slide had an error last time, the concave on the bottom line. He used to say convex, and that's wrong. It's concave places on the that cause difficulty and also hyperbolic regions. Okay, so that's basically where we were last time. And now we're going to continue on. And I also said last time that it's useful to think of a shape, at least one with spherical topology as being a deformation of an ellipsoid. The ellipsoid is a particularly simple skeleton, namely an ellipse, a planar ellipse. And we know all sorts of things about that planar ellipse. We know what its center point is. We know what its long axis is. We, we know what its what that ellipse's radii are by this by this formula. getting me. Okay, we have these formulas for the ellipse, and so we can find any place we want on the ellipse, which is the skeleton. And we also have formulas for the spokes from any such place. We know that all analytically. And the notion is that we're going to describe a, an, an object or find out what its skeleton is by a deformation from the ellipsoid whose skeleton we know all about into our target object. I told you last time that when we make that transformation, we want to make sure that the vertices of the ellipsoid go into the vertices of the target object. We want to make sure that the crest, which we know formulaically of the ellipsoid, which is a scribble thing, uh, goes into the crest on the object. So if you see here, you see um, the ellipsoid look, looked face on. So it's, it's got depth in the screen. The long axis is vertical here. The medium axis is horizontal here. And the smallest axis is in and out of the screen. Okay. And it has a crest around where this the boundary of this yellow excuse me, this yellow curve. It's got a skeleton, which is this ellipse. These bold points have spokes that go into the crest. Okay, everybody. And now we're going to try and warp this guy into our object. And when we do that, this guy has a vertex here and a vertex here. We want to have it that this guy maps onto here. <laughs> this guy maps onto here. <laughs> the skeleton will have two vertices in this example. And they the vertex of the skeleton should map onto the vertex of the deformed skeleton, likewise for the other vertex. <laughs> and then the 
fold of the ellipse should map onto the fold of the skeleton. Okay, we want all that to happen. <laughs> and the reason we want that to happen is because if it happens for each element in the population, we can expect to get good correspondence. <laughs> and <clears throat> okay, now I want to talk about the skeletal coordinates. We talked about the idea that from the skeleton, there are these spokes that go from the skeleton out to out to the boundary. So in 2D, these are easy to, to think about. You have the you have a skeleton that's a folded thing. And you have these spokes that go from the skeleton up to the boundary. In 3D, <coughs> the center thing is a curved surface. A folded curved surface. And for every point on it, there are also these spokes. And so, what we're going to do is we want to parameterize where we are along the spoke. So, that's maybe 60% of the way from the spoke. That's the radial distance we talked about. And we're going to talk about this as tau sub 2 which is the fraction of the way you are from the skeleton up to the boundary. Okay. But now we have our skeleton, which comes out of the board here, and I've rotated it so we can see it on the See it face on. If not, except it's not planar. And it has a skeleton. And that skeleton we call a spine. Okay? <clears throat> so if you look here, the spine of the ellipsoid was just this straight line. It turned into a curved line by this by this diffeomorphism. But we still have a fold of the spine, like here and back. And this guy has a direction from it out to its boundary, which is the fold. Right? So we have this. Distance within the skeleton, and we can talk about the fraction of the way here. So maybe this is tau sub one equal to third. So tau sub two tells us how far out we are from the skeleton to the 3D object boundary. Tau sub one tells us how far we are from the spine, the fraction of the way we are from the spine out to the out to the uh, fold. And in order to um, have two only needs to be positive, but we have to distinguish between between tau ones that are on one side and, and on the other side. So this place we're going to call tau one equals minus the third. Okay, so it's going to be tau one equals zero on the spine, tau sub one fraction of the way on the top side of the object, if you will. I'm the, sorry, the, oh, one side of the, of the spine and south of the negative on the other side of the spine. Okay? So now notice that if I tell you a place on the, uh, if I tell you a place on the spine, for example, this place here, and I tell you pass of one, then you know the, if you know these <coughs> vectors, you can find your way out to that fraction of the way out. And then from there, 
you can talk about the spoke that comes out of there and the fraction of it. And so point being that we can use this theta and tau one and tau two to talk about any any place in the in the interior of the object or on the boundary, the closure of the interior is going to have a unique theta tau one tau two. And those theta tau one tau twos across a population are intended to be to designate correspondence. So if you have two objects in your population and you're at theta tau one tau two within object one, and you have another object and you have theta tau the same theta tau one tau two in that object, you will get you the idea is that what you want is those two places are in correspondence. And you've arranged them to be in correspondence by making this deformation uh, consistently holding the important geometric properties of the objects. Okay, so I said we needed a way to say where we are on the spine. And that's what the theta does. <clears throat> For the ellipsoid, theta starts out at theta equals zero on the top side of the top side of the ellipse. Sorry, the top side of the skeleton of the ellipse, the top side of the spine. And it goes like theta's normally do in counterclockwise direction. Out to here at theta equals pi over two, and that down to here at theta equals pi, and here three pi over two or equivalently minus pi over two. And so from minus pi over two to plus pi over two is on this side of the spine. And from pi over two to three pi over two, it's on this side. You're on this side of the spine. And so theta is going to take us around around the spine, but equivalently, we have level surfaces, onion skins, of tau sub one within the skeleton, and onion skins of tau two from the skeleton out into the ellipsoid. Any questions on that? A little bit complicated. Um, okay, so now <clears throat> consider an object that has had this diffeomorphism applied and where we have tapped we have made the the boundary goes onto the boundary the the scope the crest go onto the crest and the vertices go onto the vertices <laughs> you'd like something even more from the diffeomorphism <laughs> you'd like the onion skins to go onto the corresponding onion skin. So you'd like the tau to of onion skin to go of one of this object to go onto the tau to onion skin of the other. And in order to do that, you need straight spokes under the diffeomorphism. So we need spokes in the on the 3D object that map the whole straight spoke maps under the corresponding straight spoke and that the tattoo values are maintained. Okay, so the fraction of spoke length, if, if the place that's halfway along maps onto halfway along. Now you ought to con be concerned because those spokes can be straight, but what about these spokes that are in the skeleton? The skeleton is no longer straight, 
right? It's a pair of circuits. <clears throat> and so you have these sort of vectors that go from the spine out to the poles along a curved surface. And that's painful. It's been solved tentatively by just using the tau two, the tau one, excuse me, from the ellipsoid. But you will see shortly a new solution by the Harry in which the skeleton is made by having swept plane cross sections of the object, planes that don't intersect inside the object. So you see in the bottom the swept plane idea. In each swept plane, you have a 2D cross section of the object. Okay, so let this be the 2D cross section, one of those 2D cross sections. It's planar, right? So now my skeleton of it is planar. This is the skeleton. And now I don't have a curved skeleton anymore. I have a planar, a planar section of skeleton. <clears throat> And thus, this problem that I've just talked about is, sol is solved here, meaning that straight spokes in the ellipsoid can still now go into straight spokes in this swept plane idea. And straight spokes from the skeleton go onto straight spokes. And so we can make want to make our diffeomorphism satisfy all the all the things that we want. We designed for it. Okay. Um, we'll talk more about the Harry's method later. The question then is, yeah, great, but the data comes as boundaries. We have to calculate what the skeletons are. Another way of saying that is we have to figure out what diffeomorphism from the ellipsoid we should compute. The, the means of doing that has been accomplished by a smoothing flow of the boundary. So if you start out, for example, with this mandible on the left side of this long figure, and you start smoothing all the places on the boundary appropriately, and I'll talk about what appropriately is, it smooths away the protrusions and the indentations. And after a bit of smoothing, you have the next the second from the left item, which we'll call, which we refer to as the bent hot dog. Okay. <laughs> but the bent hot dog is very nice. It has no protrusion. It has two vertices. It has nice crest. We know what to do at that point. <laughs> but what we're going to do is we're going to keep smoothing. So smoothing is basically taking some sort of a weighted average of a region of the boundary at every point. <laughs> and as this smoothing occurs, in the limit, it becomes a sphere. You've smoothed it away so that all the curvatures are the same. But before you get there in the smoothing, it gets to be approximately an ellipsoid. And so the notion is, if we could smooth this in what we call forward flow to an ellipsoid, then we can find a skeleton of the ellipsoid. You know that analytically. And we want to 
invert that process. We want to go from the ellipsoid back onto the bent hot dog. Eventually, we'll talk about getting onto the actual <clears throat> uh, object with, with protrusions in it as well. But for the time being, let's worry about getting back to the bent, bent hot dog appropriate. Questions on anything at this point? <clears throat> so we're going to make a forward flow to an ellipsoid. We fit the ellipsoid with its skeleton. And then we want to do a backwards flow that maintains all this correspondence stuff that I've just talked about. Okay? The, the method that was first proposed for doing this was called mean curvature flow. So you will notice <clears throat> that at every point on any object, smooth object, <clears throat> mean differentiable object, doubly differentiable, that there is this me measure that we call mean curvature. It's the average of the two principal curvature. And we're gonna let that act kind of like what happens on a curve. Okay, so look at the curve in the upper right. This is a something that we have as a target we want to start smoothing. At every point on that, we have a, a tangent direction and a normal direction, right, in 2D. Moving points along the tangent don't, doesn't change the shape. It just changes the parameterization, right? It moves from a point on the object infinitesimally to another place on the on the on the. So changing the shape needs to involve moving along the normal. And intuitively, you can see that if the point is is convex and we want to smooth it, we should move it inward along the normal. And we'll call that positive curvature. And if it's concave, to smooth it, we want to move it outward. And so what we're going to do, what we do in 2D would be to have a smoothing operation that would make D if C is the curvature value, XY. You see by DT where T is smoothing. For T, as T increases, you're smoothing more and more. You want D, you see by DT to be kappa times the norm, where the sign of kappa determines whether you're moving inward about the norm or, or outward around the norm. Okay, so far? That's, it turns out, in some sense, that's the optimal smoother. And it does eventually reach a sphere, but on the, I mean, a circle, <clears throat> but on the way gets very close to an ellipse. Well, we take the same idea and we replace curvature in 2D by mean curvature in 3D. The 2D surface in 3D has two principal curvatures, and we need some other. And the, what was suggested was the mean curvature. Now, notice that the normal is a function of where you are on the boundary. Here I call the boundary B rather than C. And the mean curvature is also a function of the boundary position. 
different boundary positions to get different mean curvature. But as you move the object, both the normals and the mean curvature change because it's moving. So you got to make this a function of C. Okay, so the upshot is we can run this differential equation and that causes moving. And that sounds cool. That's what people first thought of. Okay. But we, in fact, first thought of. The difficulty is that it doesn't behave right at the vertices. And if you have multiple vertices, it doesn't behave right at all of those vertices. As you can see from the second diagram from the top, P is along this a, a lot along this uh, from left to right, and eventually you see that the vertex of the of this original object on the left turns into a a very, very sharp, a singular point. Okay. No good. We wanted to smooth our ellipsoid, and all of a sudden, the or smooth our original object, and even apply to the ellipsoid, the vertices would not smooth at all. They get this ridiculous sharp point. So if a clever person that can plus minus touch down came up with a modified version of mean curvature flow. And it's called conformalized mean curvature flow because it, it uses the, the standard ideas of conformal mathematics that, that have to do with maintaining direction. And the method basically works by instead of running this differential equation according to the Euclidean metric, which is what you're doing, you make a modified metric that starts out as the Euclidean metric but changes with time. So this G sub T thing is the metric tensor that we talked about in our early mathematics discussion. And when you do it that way, it's designed so that you get the picture, the, the second picture from the bottom, where you don't get the singularity. Okay, so now the new idea is no, let's not use mean curvature flow. Let's use com uh, conformalized mean curvature flow. And that will take us, as this example shows, where conformalized mean curvature flow has been applied into the bent hot dog and then from the bent hot dog down into the ellipsoid into the ellipsoid it's not precisely into the ellipsoid so we get a diffeomorphism from the almost ellipsoid into our whatever whatever our target object is i mean and we have to do one little further step of taking the best fitting ellipsoid to this almost ellipsoid. And then we have one final little piece of diffeomorphism to do also. Okay, so now we have the ability to go backwards flow in theory, right? We've taken this guy and we've taken it down to the almost ellipsoid, and then we fit the best fitting. Real ellipsoid, we know it's skeleton, and the idea is to backwards flow this into the into the darker object. Okay. 
and to do so while maintaining all those nice properties that we talked about. Press and so on. So fat chance. The difficulty is seen here. Thanks to Nick for these figures. When you take the bent hot dog that you see down here and run it into the lift load, it looks like it's very nicely under going under formalized mean parameter into the lift load, and it is. But the trouble is that the object, which is well meshed in the sense of all the mesh elements are the same area, they get really small as you get towards the as you get towards the vertex. Put another way, there's a collapse of the object near the ellipsoid, near the uh, vertex of the object and you get these many 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 points at the vertex and not and as you get away from the vertex you get fewer and fewer and fewer points and they're very sparse in the middle and what you really like to do is to sample the ellipsoid the way we talked about before where it is but you see here on the top right figure, you'd like a sampling of the ellipsoid that is pretty regular in in theta and tau one. And for that matter, tau two. Okay, so when that happens, you can't just say take all the points that were on the ellipsoid as they came from the object and map them back because you have this uh, <clears throat> strong dependence of which points are which on the on the smooth boundary, depending on the actual curvatures on the object. All right. So if we have two objects and one of them has got a slightly sharper curvature near its vertex, and another one a little bit less you're going to not get the kind of correspondence that we're after. So, the solution that Nick is well along in producing is to remesh the object at various stages of T. And then do a sequence of shape maintaining diffio from one to the other. Right? So what we want is we have the uh, well picture up here. We have the bent ellipsoid. It's uh, <coughs> mapped onto this other ellipsoid. We'll re remesh the ellipsoid, and we're going to map it by a, a, a appropriate diffeomorphism back a little ways, and then we'll remesh so that they're equal. And then we can apply that reverse diffeomorphism again and again, so we get a we talk about going backwards in time. We go from time zero, which is the object, out to big T, which is the ellipsoid. And then we go from T to T minus one, or from T minus one to T minus two, and from T minus two to T minus three, and so on. We get a succession of diffeomorphisms. All this because it's really important to get correspondence. And that all this geometry is intended to produce the kind of correspondence we need. Indeed, when we did this with ordinary mean curvature flow on objects that didn't have much problem with it, we found that the, that the statistics we produced from classification, we got better classification than 
if we did a variety of other choices of trying to get cars work. Okay. And we expecting that this complicated situation that I talked about of doing a formalized mean curvature flow to get ellipsoid, start with the skeleton of that ellipsoid, including its quotes, and go a little ways back, making sure that the skeleton behaves like a skeleton and that all these things map. And then we go to the next stage and the next stage, and we finally get back to the object. That that will produce even better correspondence. <laughs> These notions of good skeletal correspondence that do most especially to Jim Damon, unfortunately, relate to Jim. Okay. Well, it's better than there's more we can say about correspondence. And it comes from this coordinate system that we've just talked about. So let me remind you that when we had a boundary of an object, we had fitted frames where one of the frame elements was a normal and two others were, let's say, in the principal directions in the tangent plane. And we have this really nice idea that we're going to describe the swing of the normal in the local coordinate system, right? So here, the swing of the normal is in this coordinate system, but over here, the swing of the normal is in its local coordinate system. It's a vector, the, the direction into which the normal swings is a vector in the tangent plane, and we're gonna represent the tangent plane by its local coordinate system. That was a very powerful method because it allows us to talk about curvatures, uh, the curvature behavior sort of independent of, among other things, alignment. So if I have this point here and I talk about the, the rate of swing in its tangent plane and the, ob and the object is rotated or translated it's still going to be the case that the that in that tangent, local tangent plane relative to it, the rotation of the normal behavior stays the same. The principal curvature stay the same. And so we're going to want this kind of behavior for objects in 3D skeletally related. because these frame rotations and translations are going to be important features, shape features to us. So till now, we have the skeleton and we have all these onion skins and each onion skin is parameterized by its L2. And there's a different onion again for each L2 value. And within an onion skin, we can parameterize the places by the theta which spine point you're on, and by its tau one. So an onion skin for tau two is parameterized by its theta and tau one, right? And what I'm telling you we want is an onion skin related frame. If we can do that, we'll have a frame, that is to say a local coordinate system for the skeleton, that's at tau two equals zero. We're gonna have a frame at every point on tau two equals one, which is the boundary. And we'll also have a fitted frame for every other tau two. 
right? And so this idea of fit and frame now, not for the as just for the boundary, but for the interior of the object, yields a uh, As shown here, little frames everywhere on the skeleton or everywhere on the boundary or everywhere on every onion skin. That is to say, everywhere inside the object on the boundary, the closure, the, the whole interior and its closure of the boundary have a local coordinate system. And now we can talk about how the Fitted the frame rotates as we walk along in tau one or in tau two or in theta or in any direction, right? It's just like what we got on the boundary, but better because it's the whole interior that you can walk, walk with. It. And so now, if you have, for example, one place on the skeleton and another place on the skeleton, you can talk about how the fitted frame rotates from here to here. It talks about the shape, and this is a rotation not only of the normal, but not only of one of those vectors in the fitted frame, but for all three of them. But the thing may not just tip this way, but it may twist around that way as you rotate. Okay. So it gives you very powerful geometric information. And now I want to talk about what the vector is from, let's say, this fine center that we have here, this blue and yellow thing in the skeleton. And you want to talk about what happens. What about the vector from here to here? You can write that vector in the local coordinates of the center. See how that works? So now instead of writing it in X, Y, Z, just like you had before with the fitted frame on the boundary for ordinary boundaries, you now can talk about going from any point to any other point. And you can write that in the coordinate system, in the local coordinate system of the tail of that that motion. Well, we're later going to be wanting to talk about multiple objects. So this is an old old picture, very of uh, three parts of the the male pelvis, uh, the bladder here, the prostate here and the rectum here. Not much of this shape idea for skeletons originally was worked out worrying about radiation treatment of prostate cancer. Okay, and in prostate cancer, you need to know exactly what the position and shape is of the prostate so you can irradiate it. And you also need to know the, the at the shape of the rectum and the shape of the bladder, because you don't want to burn a hole in the rectum, you can poison the body. Right? So, and likewise, you don't want to over don't want to over radiate the, the bladder. But the main point here is if we're going to do shape analysis of this, we're going to need to know, for example, where the prostate is in rectum relevant terms, or where the bladder is, the, where, the, the, where the prostate is in bladder relevant terms. But those translations, for example, from the, the, the center of this guy, notice I'm talking about the skeletal center, from this guy can be written now in the coordinates, the local coordinate system of the of the prostate 
or any other local coordinate. And that buys us very nice shape relations that are independent of alignment. So a whole lot of the problem you saw in the in the uh, Shivastava idea was that you wanted to get transformations modulo, you wanted to get geometry, modulo alignment and modulo <coughs> parameterization. Well, we now have the parameterization driven by the geometry it's a theta tau one tau two. And now we have the alignment in terms of local frames, which means that when you rotate something or translate the whole objects, it doesn't matter. You still get the same relation. So we are, we have in common with Shivastava's method, this notion of trying to mod out, if you will, reparameterization and uh, and uh, alignment. Moreover, there are serious problems when if you try to do it with alignment, because if I have, for example, an object here, which is one hippocampus, and I have another hippocampus that for some reason or other was imaged and missing its tail. How do you align those two things? If you're just using something like center of gravity, it's not gonna, not gonna work. And on top of that, if you have multi-object complex, do I align the whole complex as a whole? Do I align based only on the prostate and let the other Objects sort of follow it. Half the point is alignment is global, but global with respect to what? And the big deal is to avoid alignment, to mine out alignment. And using these fitted frames and the representation of one a frame at one point with a frame at the other in the local coordinate system does just that. Okay, so. This notion of A fitted frame and then geometry relative to local frame was a wonderful idea of the mathematician called Carton, who was Ailey Carton, this two Carton. And there's a page in Kundering Solid Shakespeare that shows some of the math that Gauss produced at the, when he invented differential geometry, geometry of surface. And it's this unbelievable math. Every different symbol has two or three superscripts and two or three subscripts. Very hard to understand. And that's because he was trying to do it all in a fixed XYZ coordinate, a fixed frame. And, and Carton said, no, 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 no. Local frames. And represent the geom the local geometry and local frames. And all of a sudden, you understand differential geometry. You get these nice notions that I, the way I taught geom differential geometry to you in the earlier part of the course. Well, the same thing happens here. With fitted frames and geometry also the curvature, but here on, whereas Carton is on the object surfaces, on the object boundary, this is fitted frame in the whole closure of the interior. That is to say, on the skeleton 
on the uh, boundary and everywhere in between. So, <clears throat> if I write F double underline, meaning F1, F2, F3, where F1 is a is a three tuple, a unit vector of one of the frame elements, and F2 is another one, and F3 is the third frame. So it's a triple, and you have one of those at any theta that one that two, you can now talk about things like what happens when you walk from one place in the interior to another place in the interior, or one along one onion skin, or what have you, with regard to the swing of this bit of frame. And write that that swing in the local frame. I believe that's a big deal. Okay. So essentially what you end up with is local com local compasses for your object you get rulers that are locally measured so and as i've indicated when we get to interobject relations we're going to want to be able to talk about local relations between places on one object and places in a different object when you have an object complex and all of this makes alignment unnecessary you just don't have to do it This uh, figure shows some frames that are on the boundary, some fitted frames, and some others that are on the skeleton, but they're everywhere. So, what are these fitted frames? <laughs> Let's I mean, wave my hands at how important they're going to be, but what are they? And here, I define them, at least for the ellipsoid. So first let's look at the ellipse in 2D. So the basic idea for the ellipse in 2D that at any point on any onion skin, you can have a tangent to the onion skin and you can have a normal to the onion skin. And that forms a, a local frame, onion skin by onion skin. You will some funny things happen at the fold. I'll not get into here, but the writing about these fitted frames talks about what this discontinuities of the of the frame and uh, at the fold, and in particular, as you cross the spine, you go from a frame that's here to one. Where the normals on this side. I should have had the other one a different color. So if I'm on the red side of the fold, I get this frame discontinuously jumping onto the other side of the onto the other side of the fold. And the same thing goes for the for this uh the skeleton, the, the 3D object skeleton, which has the top side and the bottom side. So you get discontinuities across whether you're on the top side or the bottom side of the skeleton. Where's my the very nice cap? Okay. 
So far, so good. In 3D, <laughs> we're going to do the same thing. We'll have a normal to the a normal to the onion skin. And within the onion skin, I've said you walk in either theta or T1. And if I fix tape tau one, right? <clears throat> And walk walk along in theta, I can find a tangent for that. And that can be F2. And then I'm going to compute F1 as the uh, cross product of the other two. Okay. So now we have the ability to do. All this geometry from these local terms. And on top of that, what we need to be able to do, if we're going to do as we do in SREPs, where we have sample skeletons, we have to be able to get interpolated spokes other than at the sample position. Right? So we have a spoke. You have a spoke here and a spoke here, but you may need a spoke halfway in between them or two thirds or any, anywhere in between them. And it turns out that these interpolations can be done absolutely beautifully in terms of these fitted frames. Yeah. That's not one of these. It's the yeah, yeah. complementary. Once you have a normal and you have a an F2, then you just take their product to get the other. But if I have along the on the onion, along the I mean, fix it's if you move theta and keep uh, keep tau one. Then fix the now. What? You know, you're moving along in theta. So I'm moving essentially I'm moving along the spine. Tau two is already fixed, yes. Tau two defines the onion skin. So that's fixed. And now on that onion skin, you're gonna talk about level sets of tau one. I have a question. Yeah. So you've chosen to make the second frame structure. You've chosen to fix how line varies theta. So why not fix theta and varies tau one? Yes. Why not? Uh, <clears throat> somehow the notion of theta varying being more basic because it will describe where you are on the on the spine. Seems to make sense, seems to make intuitive sense, but yeah, it's a matter of intuition. You're right. Okay, so now my point is that we can talk about rotations of the frame in these. We can talk about spoke interpolation. But spoke interpolation means not only U interpolation, the, the direction of the spoke interpolation, but also the length interpolation. But the, the length interpolation, I gave you an equation from before that the dr operator that allows you to do length interpolation in terms of things that involve the radial shape. <coughs> and thus, you want to do locally in this frame system. Okay, so because the swing of the spoke and the direction of the spoke we saw long ago is related to the gradient of the of the uh, length, the spoke length. Finally, how do you do frame interpolation? Well, frames live in 
a frame which is simply a rotation matrix, if you will. It lives on S3. On the three, actually on the, it, it lives on SO3, which is a hemisphere, a hemisphere of S3, of the three-dimensional sphere. I can't draw a three-dimensional sphere. I can barely draw a two, a two sphere, which I've done here. But the point is that if you're trying to interpolate between a point on S3 and another point on S3, both of which are frames, you know perfectly well what the geodesics are between points on a sphere. And you can simply interpolate along those geodesics. Okay. And for those who are into the underlying representations, that's most easily done using quaternion. Okay, so make a long story short, we can take sampled objects, spatially sampled objects. Sorry for the double use of the word sample. I use sample both for an element of a population of objects, but also samples for the positions, sample positions within an object. You can get spatially sampled objects and interpolate them so that we have frames and distances relative to frames anywhere. In other words, the sample population yields a continuous representation. So next Thursday, Paul and the following Tuesday, Paul Yushkovich is going to talk about his CM reps. And he calls C for continuous. Continuous medial representation. Well, they're continuous in the sense that they're parameterized by lines or by some other uh, continuous representation. But the parameters are just a, just a discrete set of parameters. So they're continuous because the parameters imply the continuity. In our case, that you have discrete samples on the on the uh, skeleton, but you can interpolate everywhere, and therefore you have a continuous representation also from this discrete representation. Here we go. This guy here. So now we can we get a continuous. Both of them. Have a parameterized have a representation that can be evaluated in any place in the art. There are notable advantages of each of them. I'll notice that I'll note in passing that our was our method was designed to do statistics on theirs wasn't, but there is designed to do physical transformations on, and ours wasn't. <laughs> Paul's ideas are very important, and he's going to give two lectures on his next Thursday and the following Tuesday. And then after a break of one lecture, break where I'll be lecturing again for our one lecture, we're going to start talking about statistics of shape representations. And the first, the Vyakti presentation on March, just the first class in March is going to be done on because shapes live on Riemannian manifolds. We're going to be concerned with how do you do statistics on Riemannian manifolds, and that's the bailiwick of Tom Fletcher. And Tom happily is at the University of Virginia, only a couple of hours drive from here. So he'll actually be physically here in class, but Paul's going to be lecturing on Zoom. Okay, we're almost done with this class. We said we had fitted frames for the ellipsoid, but when we first thought about that, we said, okay, we have fitted frames on the ellipsoid. We apply the diffeomorphism, which gives you a mapping 
for all points in the closure of the interior of the ellipsoid from the ellipsoid to the target object. Right? And what that does is it takes local linear local unit vectors. And for example, I can talk about mapping the tau one ellipsoid of the ellipsoid, tau one onion skin of the ellipsoid into the tau one onion skin of the target object, or, or the tau two into the tau two onion skin, and so on. And I can worry about how those frames that you know analytically from the ellipsoid map into the target object. Well, one way to do that is to just look at, for example, one of the frame elements, and rotate it, and let's get the other ones orthogonal to it. You get a new frame. But if you do it to each one of the frame elements separately, what happens is they don't stay orthogonal. The warp deorthogonalizes F1, F2, and F3. And not only does it deorthogonalize them, it deunitizes them. It makes it stretches some of them and compresses others. And so you get a mapping from a unit, a, a triple of unit vectors, an ordinary frame, into what's called an affine frame. It's still three space spanning vectors, but the basis vectors are now neither necessarily unit nor necessarily or something. And this affine frame carries shape information. The transformation from the ordinary orthogonal unit frames into these other at various places, differently at different places, tells you shape information of this object. And so Zhu Yan Zhu noted that and noted when he did statistics using properties of the affine frame for his classifications, he got better classifications than if he used the orthogonal frame. They're orthogonal on the ellipsoid, but they're not orthogonal. And so these angles form skeletal features. So what I've said now is if you have an object and you want to do statistics on it, you need a feature tuple for each individual object. What features? Well, you want to know where these positions are relative to, for example, the center point, or relative to a nearby point on the spine, or relative to the next to the neighbor point. So you want to know what, what the frame, uh, for example, on the skeleton here is in the coordinate system of the frame here. You want positions in local terms. You want spoke lengths. Yep, that's width of the object. That's very important. They very well want these affine frame lengths. So far, all these guys are have a length coordinate. But now you have a whole bunch of directions, right? You have both directions, frame vector directions, FI frame vector directions. Each one of them directions in local coordinates. And those form features. 
Of course, if they're directions, they need to be Euclideanized if you're going to do statistics. Okay, so I'm at the end of this lecture. Where we're going to go now is all everything I've been talking about so far really has been on continuous skeletal representation. And now we're going to, I, I need to talk about this discrete representation where we have a grid of places. And once we do that, I'm going to need to talk about how you take a, a discrete S rep and to fit it into a boundary so that you get skeletal representation from the boundary. And so that's where we're going next time is this notion of, first of all, S reps. Secondly, why S? Because it's not medial. We'll see that. They're quasi medial. And then what about all this math that I've been telling you about that I developed a medial stuff? And the short answer is that we're still works math. And then we'll talk about fitting of S reps to boundaries. And once we finish that, we will talk about a CNN to do all this. And then we'll talk about multi object S reps and multi figure S reps. And then we'll get to the plane S reps of Tahari. So that'll take us at least. That'll take us next lecture, and then Paul is going to be here for two lectures after that. Any questions? I will try to summarize what I said. I said a whole mouthful in this lecture. Next time. Until then. Thank you.